Welcome, 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 one and all, to more spooky ghost stories. <laughs> Clumsy by fact says hi, Ghost Luke. Yeah, that's right, it's Ghost Luke. Hello. What an entrance, says Eveline Verberg. Thanks. I was wondering if I could make that work in my streaming software, to be honest. I thought it's going to look pretty dumb if it doesn't work. But hey, I thought that was fun. All right, well, I'll do that from now on then, definitely. Welcome along, everyone. Welcome to another reading of some old gothic ghost stories. Uh, we've got two stories to read today. They are both absolute bangers. It's going to be amazing. Um, Gentleman Drill, uh, thank you very much for the super chat, says, Bad weather on, lights off, I'm ready for the spooking. Really excited for today's stories. Yeah, they are going to be great. Piper Barnes says, Count Westaway. Mmm, I think I could pull that off. I'm quite pale, you know? I don't really own enough land, is the problem. Um, I mean, that is just the problem uh, that I face. Um, I need a castle. And there's no two ways about it. Um, Best Bloomer says, Luke could make a very good vampire. Thank you. Um, I don't know if I've really got it in me to uh, bite someone in the neck and suck out all their blood. <laughs> I don't know if I could do that. Uh, Paul Harry says, Luke is dead and he's talking to us from beyond the grave. That's right. Well, I have temporarily returned from beyond the grave um, to read you uh, two stories today. The first one is going to be The Shadows on the Wall, which is a story by Mary E. Wilkins Freeman. Now, you're probably wondering, who is this Mary E. Wilkins Freeman? Well, viewer, well... Boy, can I tell. Boy, can I read you a Wikipedia page. Mary Eleanor Wilkins Freeman, uh, born 1852 in Randolph, Massachusetts. A prominent 19th century American author. She wrote loads and loads of, um, of stuff. A lot of novels, a lot of short stories. Not all ghost stories, not all horror, but quite a lot. Um, there is a, uh, you know, a, a solid collection of ghost stories. So if we enjoy this, we can definitely come back to Mary E. Wilkins Freeman. Um, and I don't want to big it up too much in case you don't like it, but I think this one we're going to read today is really cool. It's quite short, it's punchy, but it's, um, well, I just think it's cool. Um, she had, uh, an interesting life. Um, her father died suddenly in 1883, um, leaving her without any immediate family and not much of an estate financially. Um, she got married, uh, although her husband suffered from alcoholism and an addiction to sleeping powders. He had a reputation for driving fast horses and womanizing, uh, and he was committed to um, a hospital for the insane in Trenton, and the two uh, separated a year later. Um, after his death in 1923, he left the majority of his wealth to his chauffeur and only one dollar to his former wife. So there you go. Um... So there you go. Uh, not an easy life, by the sounds of it, but she did write a lot of really good stuff. Um, and we are going to read some of it. What a jerk, says Binary. Yeah, that's uh, that sounds like the vibe. And Beth Bloom says, insert warning about Victorian morals here. Yeah, well, I mean, let's do our normal disclaimer before we start the stories. As ever, uh, although we enjoy these ghost stories, the real horror can be Victorian attitudes too. Um, women, colonialism, race, nationality, sexuality, um, and a whole host of other things. Mm. But the, um, uh, yay, fancy goblet, says Shy Violet. That's right. There we go. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, Rebecca M says, Victorian attitudes to take your pick, to be honest. Yeah, that's about right. Infil X Soros says, don't forget mental health. Ah, uh, yes, well, indeed. Speaking of Mary Eleanor Wilkins, is Free Freeman's husband, um, who ended up in a, a mental institution, would not have been a good time. Um, so she died in 1930. The story uh, that we are reading today, I believe, was published in... 
1904. Uh, and it is called The Shadows on the Wall. Right, I think that is enough build up. I think that is enough. Um, quite enough reading from Wikipedia. So let's crack on, shall we? Oh, we've got a super chat just before we begin from Frigo Jonas. He says, my girlfriend really got a liking for your streams and overall character. Can you greet her, Anne-Marie, for me? That would be so lovely. Hello, Anne-Marie. Thank you so much for tuning in to the streams. I'm so happy you're enjoying them. And uh, thank you for complimenting my overall character. That is probably the best compliment I've ever had. It's so all-encompassing. Um, yeah, very enjoyable. Yeah, the shadows on the walls. What we're going to read, and then afterwards we will read uh, M.R. James, who we've um, who we've dipped into a few times before on previous streams. We are reading the brilliantly titled "Oh Whistle and I'll Come to You, My Lad" from uh, his short stories, um, "Ghost Stories of an Antiquary." So here we go: "Shadows on the Wall" by Mary E. Wilkins Freeman. <clears throat> Henry had words with Edward in the study the night before Edward died, said Caroline Glynn. She spoke not with acrimony, but with grave severity. Rebecca Anne Glynn gasped by way of assent. She sat in a wide flounce of black silk in the corner of the sofa and rolled terrified eyes from her sister Caroline to her sister, Mrs Stephen Brigham, who had been Emma Glynn, the one beauty of the family. The latter was beautiful still, with a large, splendid, full-blown beauty. She filled a great rocking chair with her superb bulk of femininity, and swayed gently back and forth, her black silks whispering and her black frills fluttering. Even the shock of death, for her brother Edward lay dead in the house, could not disturb her outward serenity of demeanour. But even her expression of masterly placidity changed before her sister Caroline's announcement and her sister Rebecca Anne's gasp of terror and distress in response. I think Henry might have controlled his temper when poor Edward was so near his end, she said, with an asperity which disturbed slightly the roseate curves of her beautiful mouth. Of course he did not know, murmured Rebecca Anne in a faint tone. Of course he did not know it, said Caroline quickly. She turned on her sister with a strange, sharp look of suspicion. Then she shrank as if from the other's possible answer. Rebecca gasped again. The married sister, Mrs Emma Brigham, was now sitting up straight in the chair. She had ceased rocking and was eyeing them both intently with a sudden accentuation of family likeness in her face. What do you mean? She said impartially to them both. Then she too seemed to shrink before a possible answer. She even laughed an evasive sort of laugh. <laughs> Nobody means anything, said Caroline. Caroline firmly. She rose and crossed the room toward the door with grim decisiveness. Where are you going? asked Mrs Brigham. I have something to see to, replied Caroline, and the others at once knew by her tone that she had some solemn and sad duty to perform in the chamber of death. Oh, said Mrs Brigham. After the door had closed behind Caroline, she turned to Rebecca. Did Henry have many words with him? she asked. They were talking very loud replied Rebecca evasively. Mrs Brigham looked at her. She had not resumed rocking. She sat up straight with a slight knitting of intensity on her fair forehead, between the pretty rippling curves of her auburn hair. Did you ever hear anything? She asked in a low voice with a glance toward the door. I was just across the hall in the south parlour, and that door was open, and this door ajar, replied Rebecca with a slight flush. Then you must have couldn't help it. Everything? Most of it. What was it? The old story. I suppose Henry was mad, as he always was, because Edward was living on here for nothing, when he had wasted all the money father left him. Rebecca nodded, with a fearful glance at the door. When Emma spoke again, her voice was still more hushed. I know how he felt, said she. It must have looked to him as if Edward was living at his expense, but he wasn't. No, he wasn't. And Edward has a right here according to the terms of father's will, and Henry ought to have remembered it. Yes, he ought. Did he say hard things? Pretty hard from what I heard. What? 
I heard him tell Edward that he had no business here at all, and he thought he had better go away. What did Edward say? That he would stay here as long as he lived, and afterward too, if he was a mind to, and he would like to see Henry get him out, and then... What? Then he laughed. What did Henry say? I didn't hear him say anything, but... But what? I saw him when he came out of this room. He looked mad? You've seen him when he looked so. Emma nodded. The expression of horror on her face had deepened. Do you remember that time he killed the cat because she had scratched him? Yes, don't. Then Caroline re-entered the room. She went up to the stove in which a wood fire was burning. It was a cold, gloomy day of fall, and she warmed her hands, which were reddened from recent washing, in cold water. Mrs Brigham looked at her and hesitated. She glanced at the door, which was still ajar. It did not easily shut, being still swollen with the damp weather of the summer. She rose and pushed it together with a sharp thud, which jarred the house. Rebecca started painfully with a half exclamation. Caroline looked at her disapprovingly. It is time you controlled your nerves, Rebecca, she said. Mrs Brigham, returning from the closed door, said imperiously that it ought to be fixed it shut so hard. It will shrink enough after we have had the fire a few days, replied Caroline. I think Henry ought to be ashamed of himself for talking as he did to Edward, said Mrs Brigham abruptly, but in an almost inaudible voice. Hush, said Caroline with a glance of actual fear at the closed door. Nobody can hear with the door shut. I say again, I think Henry ought to be ashamed of himself. I shouldn't think he'd ever get over it, having words with poor Edward the very night before he died. Edward was enough sight better disposition than Henry, with all his faults. I never heard him speak a cross word unless he spoke cross to Henry that last night. I don't know, but he did from what Rebecca overheard. Not so much cross as sort of soft and sweet and aggravating, sniffed Rebecca. What do you really think ailed Edward? asked Emma in hardly more than a whisper. She did not look at her sister. I know you said that he had terrible pains in his stomach and had spasms, but what do you think made him have them? Henry called it gastric trouble. You know Edward has always had dyspepsia. Mrs Brigham hesitated a moment. Was there any talk of an examination? said she. Then Caroline turned on her fiercely. No, she said in a terrible voice. No. The three sisters' souls seemed to meet on one common ground of terrified understanding through their eyes. The old-fashioned latch of the door was heard to rattle, and a push from without made the door shake ineffectually. It's Henry, Rebecca sighed rather than whispered. Mrs Brigham settled herself after a noiseless rush across the floor into her rocking chair again, and was swaying back and forth with her head comfortably leaning back when the door at last yielded, and Henry Glynn entered. He cast a covertly sharp, comprehensive glance at Mrs Brigham with her elaborate calm, at Rebecca, quietly huddled in the corner of the sofa with her handkerchief to her face and only one small, uncovered reddened ear as attentive as a dog's, and at Caroline, sitting with a strained composure in her armchair by the stove. She met his eyes quite firmly, with a look of inscrutable fear and defiance of the fear and of him. Henry Glynn looked more like this sister than the others. Both had the same hard delicacy of form, an aquilinity of feature. They confronted each other with the pitiless immovability of two statues, in whose marble lineaments emotions were fixed for all eternity. Then Henry Glynn smiled, and the smile transformed his face. He looked suddenly years younger, and an almost boyish recklessness appeared in his face, he flung himself into a chair with a gesture which was bewildering from its incongru incongruity with his general appearance. He leaned his head back, flung one leg over the other, and looked laughingly at Mrs Brigham. I declare, Emma, you grow younger every year, he said. She flushed a little and her placid mouth widened at the corners. She was susceptible to praise. Our thoughts today ought to belong to the one of us who will never grow older, said Caroline in a hard voice. Henry looked at her, still smiling. "'Of course, we none of us forget that,' said he, in a deep, gentle voice, 
But we have to speak to the living, Caroline, and I have not seen Emma for a long time, and the living are as dear as the dead. Not to me, said Caroline. She rose and went abruptly out of the room again. Rebecca also rose and hurried after her, sobbing loudly. Henry looked slowly after them. Caroline is completely unstrung, said he. Mrs Brigham rocked. A confidence in him inspired by his manner was stealing over her. Out of that confidence she spoke quite easily and naturally. His death was very sudden, said she. Henry's eyelids quivered slightly, but his gaze was unswerving. Yes, said he, it was very sudden. He was sick only a few hours. What did you call it? Gastric. You did not think of an examination? There was no need. I am perfectly certain as to the cause of his death. Suddenly Mrs Brigham felt a creep as of some live horror over her very soul. Her flesh prickled with cold before an inflection of his voice. She rose, tottering on weak knees. Where are you going? asked Henry in a strange, breathless voice. Mrs Brigham said something incoherent about some sewing which she had to do, some black for the funeral, and was out of the room. She went up to the front chamber which she occupied. Caroline was there. She went close to her and took her hands and the two sisters looked at each other. Don't speak, don't, I won't have it, said Caroline finally in an awful whisper. I won't, replied Emma. Let's take a little break there, I think. So, we've met our principal players. Sisters, three sisters and a brother, who, I don't think I'm misreading this, is heavily implied, had something to do with the death of Edward, another brother. Hmm, so, who have we got? We've got Caroline, uh, who seems the most sort of stern and hardcore of the three sisters. Then we've got Emma, who's the beautiful one. Um, she seems like a bit of a gossip. She's the one who is, uh, susceptible to praise, which is a phrase that I really enjoyed. Um, uh, and I want to skip back to how she was described as well, like right in the opening of the story, because it was, um, a great description. Um, a large, splendid, full-blown beauty, she filled a great rocking chair with her superb bulk of femininity. That is an amazing description. Yeah, and then you've got Rebecca, who seems, um... He seems a little, uh, um, a little more mild-mannered, a little more sort of easily cowed, a bit more afraid of, um, Henry, who we do not like the sound of. Uh, so Emma has interrogated Henry. Emma seems like a bit of a gossip, so I think she's the one who kind of, like, has that extra sort of interest in kind of, like, trying to get to the bottom of... Edward's death. Gastric, apparently. Hmm. Annika Brock says, Oh no, I'm late and I can't stay because work. Looking forward to listening back to this properly after dark though. Annika, um, no worries at all. Uh, enjoy it on demand. Uh, also, let's not skip over the detail that this Henry character killed a cat because it scratched him. Which, you know... I mean, talk about a red flag. Hmm. Mr. Team Corvette says it was a terrible, rapid case of the gastrics. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it could happen. Gastric, yeah. How did he die? Gastric. Yeah, sounds plausible. Yeah, Henry, everyone's, everyone's buying it. So what I like about this is that I like how much dialogue there is. Um... Not a lot of these ghost stories have this much dialogue. They tend to be from one point of view uh, and, you know, that tends to be one author relating everything. Whereas, you know, this is it's not from the first person, which I um, which I enjoy. Um, hmm. I'm also liking just and we can talk about this maybe a bit more later, but I'm mean, just enjoying how much this small vignette of this like, you know, living room scene uh, tells you about sort of um, uh, gender dynamics of the time. That you've got these three sisters who, like, suspect that their brother has killed their other brother, but are completely, it seems, powerless to do anything about it. 
um, they can only sort of winkingly question him. Henry seems like he has all the power in this situation. Right. I think should we crack on? Okay, so... We skip forward now in time a little bit. That afternoon, the three sisters were in the study. Mrs Brigham was hemming some black material. At last she laid her work on her lap. It's no use, I cannot see to sew another stitch until we have a light, said she. Caroline, who was writing some letters at the table, turned to Rebecca, in her usual place on the sofa. Rebecca, you had better get a lamp, she said. Rebecca started up. Even in the dusk, her face showed her agitation. It doesn't seem to me that we need a lamp quite yet, she said in a piteous, pleading voice like a child's. Yes, we do, returned Mrs Brigham peremptorily. I can't see to sew another stitch. Rebecca rose and left the room. Presently, she entered with a lamp. She set it on the table, an old-fashioned card table which was placed against the opposite wall from the window. That opposite wall was taken up with three doors. The one small space was occupied by the table. What have you put that lamp over there for? asked Mrs Brigham, with more of impatience than her voice usually revealed. Why didn't you set it in the hall and have done with it? Neither Caroline nor I can see if it is on that table. I thought perhaps you would move, replied Rebecca hoarsely. If I do move, we can't both sit at that table. Caroline has her paper all spread around. Why don't you set the lamp on the study table in the middle of the room? Then we can both see. Rebecca hesitated. Her face was very pale. She looked with an appeal that was fairly agonising at her sister Caroline. Why don't you put the lamp on this table as she says? Asked Caroline almost fiercely. Why do you act so, Rebecca? Rebecca took the lamp and set it on the table in the middle of the room without another word. Then she seated herself on the sofa and placed a hand over her eyes as if to shade them, and remained so. Does the light hurt your eyes, and is that the reason why you didn't want the lamp? asked Mrs Brigham kindly. I always like to sit in the dark, replied Rebecca chokingly. Then she snatched her handkerchief hastily from her pocket and began to weep. Caroline continued to write, Mrs Brigham to sew. Suddenly Mrs Brigham, as she sewed, glanced at the opposite wall. The glance became a steady stare. She looked intently, her work suspended in her hands. Then she looked away again and took a few more stitches. Then she looked again and again turned to her task. At last she laid her work in her lap and stared concentratedly. She looked from the wall, round the room, taking note of the various objects. Then she turned to her sisters. What is that? said she. What? asked Caroline harshly. That strange shadow on the wall, replied Mrs Brigham. Rebecca sat with her face hidden. Caroline dipped her pen in the inkstand. Why don't you turn around and look? asked Mrs Brigham in a wondering and somewhat aggrieved way. I'm in a hurry to finish this letter, replied Caroline shortly. Mrs Brigham rose, her work slipping to the floor, and began walking round the room, moving various articles of furniture with her eyes on the shadow. Then suddenly she shrieked out, Look at this awful shadow! What is it? Caroline, look, look! Rebecca, look! What is it? All Mrs Brigham's triumphant, triumphant placidity was gone. Her handsome face was livid with horror. She stood stiffly, pointing at the shadow. Then, after a shuddering glance at the wall, Rebecca burst out in a wild wail. Oh, Caroline, there it is again, there it is again! Caroline Glynn, you look, said Mrs Brigham. Look, what is that dreadful shadow? Caroline rose, turned and stood confronting the wall. How should I know? she said. It has been there every night since he died, cried Rebecca. Every night? Yes, he died Thursday and this is Saturday. That makes three nights. She stood as if holding... Caroline stood as if holding her calm with a vise of concentrated will. It, it looks like... 
like, stammered Mrs. Brigham in a tone of intense horror. I know what it looks like well enough, said Caroline. I've got eyes in my head. It looks like Edward, burst out Rebecca in a sort of frenzy of fear. Only, yes, it does, assented Mrs. Brigham, whose horror-stricken tone matched her sister's. Only, oh, it is awful. What is it, Caroline? I ask you again, how should I know, replied Caroline. I see it there like you. How should I know any more than you? It must be something in the room, said Mrs. Brigham, staring wildly around. We moved everything in the room the first night it came, said Rebecca. It is not anything in the room. Caroline turned upon her with a sort of fury. Of course it is something in the room, said she. How you act. What do you mean talking so? Of course it is something in the room. Of course it is, agreed Mrs. Brigham, looking at Caroline suspiciously. It must be something in the room. It is not anything in the room, repeated Rebecca with obstinate horror. The door opened suddenly and Henry Glynn entered. He began to speak, then his eyes followed the direction of the others. He stood staring at the shadow on the wall. What is that? He demanded in a strange voice. It must be due to something in the room, Mrs Brigham said faintly. Henry Glynn stood and stared a moment longer. His face showed a gamut of emotions. Horror, conviction, then furious incredulity. Suddenly he began hastening hither and thither about the room. He moved the furniture with fierce jerks, turning ever to see the effect upon the shadow on the wall. Not a line of its terrible outlines wavered. It must be something in the room, he declared in a voice which seemed to snap like a lash. His face changed. The inmost secrecy of his nature seemed evident upon his face, until one almost lost sight of his lineaments. Rebecca stood close to her sofa, regarding him with woeful, fascinated eyes. Mrs Brigham clutched Caroline's hand. They both stood in a corner out of his way. For a few moments he raged about the room like a caged wild animal. He moved every piece of furniture. When the moving of a piece did not affect the shadow, he flung it to the floor. Then suddenly he desisted. He laughed. What an absurdity, he said easily. Such a to-do about a shadow. That's so, assented Mrs Brigham in a scared voice which she tried to make natural. As she spoke, she lifted a chair near her. I think you have broken the chair that Edward was fond of, said Caroline. Terror and wrath were struggling for expression on her face. Her mouth was set, her eyes shrinking. Henry lifted the chair with a show of anxiety. Just as good as ever, he said pleasantly. He laughed again, looking at his sisters. Did I scare you, he said. I should think you might be used to me by this time. You know my way of wanting to leap to the bottom of a mystery, and that shadow does look queer-like, and I thought if there was any way of accounting for it, I would like to without any delay. You don't seem to have succeeded, remarked Caroline dryly, with a slight glance at the wall. Henry's eyes followed hers, and he quivered perceptibly. Oh, there is no accounting for shadows, he said, and he laughed again. A man is a fool to try to account for shadows. Then the supper bell rang, and they all left the room, but Henry kept his back to the wall, as did indeed the others. Henry led the way with an alert motion like a boy. Rebecca brought up the rear. She could scarcely walk, her knees trembled so. I can't sit in that room again this evening, she whispered to Caroline after supper. Very well, we will sit in the south room, replied Caroline. I think we will sit in the south parlour, she said aloud. It isn't as damp as the study, and I have a cold. So they all sat in the south room with their sewing. Henry read the newspaper, his chair drawn close to the lamp on the table. About nine o'clock, he rose abruptly and crossed the hall to the study. The three sisters looked at one another. Mrs Brigham rose, folded her rustling skirts compactly round her, and began tiptoeing towards the door. What are you going to do? inquired Rebecca agitatedly. I'm going to see what he is about, replied Mrs Brigham cautiously. As she spoke, she pointed to the study door across the hall. It was ajar. Henry had striven to pull it together behind him, but it had somehow swollen beyond the limit with curious speed. It was still ajar, and a streak of light showed from top to bottom. Mrs Brigham folded her skirt so tightly that her bulk with its swelling curves was revealed in a black silk sheath, and she went with a slow toddle across the hall to the study door. She stood there, her eye at the crack. 
In the south room, Rebecca stopped sewing and sat watching with dilated eyes. Caroline sewed steadily. What Mrs Brigham, standing at the crack in the study door, saw was this. Henry Glynn, evidently reasoning that the source of the strange shadow must be between the table on which the lamp stood and the wall, was making systematic passes and thrusts with an old sword which had belonged to his father all over and through the intervening space. Not an inch was left unpierced. He seemed to have divided the space into mathematical sections. He brandished the sword with a sort of cold fury and calculation. The blade gave out flashes of light. The shadow remained unmoved. Mrs Brigham, watching, felt herself cold with horror. Finally Henry ceased and stood with the sword in hand and raised as if to strike, surveying the shadow on the wall threateningly. Mrs Brigham toddled back across the hall and shut the south room door behind her before she related what she had seen. He looked like a demon, she said again. Have you got any of that old wine in the house, Caroline? I don't feel as if I could stand much more. Yes, there's plenty, said Caroline. You can have some when you go to bed. I think we'd all better take some, said Mrs Brigham. Oh, Caroline, what? Don't ask, don't speak, said Caroline. No, I'm not going to, replied Mrs Brigham, but... Soon the three sisters went to their chambers, and the south parlour was deserted. Caroline called to Henry in the study to put out the light before he came upstairs. They had been gone about an hour when he came into the room, bringing the lamp which had stood in the study. He placed it on the table and waited a few minutes, pacing up and down. His face was terrible. His fair complexion showed livid, and his blue eyes seemed dark blanks of awful reflections. Then he took up the lamp and returned to the library. He set the lamp on the centre table and the shadow sprang out on the wall. Again he studied the furniture and moved it about, but deliberately, with none of his former frenzy. Nothing affected the shadow. Then he returned to the south room with the lamp and again waited. Again he returned to the study and placed the lamp on the table and the shadow sprang out upon the wall. It was midnight before he went upstairs. Mrs Brigham and the other sisters who could not sleep heard him. The next day was the funeral. That evening the family sat in the south room. Some relatives were with them. Nobody entered the study until Henry carried a lamp in there after the others had retired for the lamp for the night. He saw again the shadow on the wall leap to an awful life before the light. The next morning at breakfast, Henry Glynn announced that he had to go to the city for three days. The sisters looked at him with surprise. He very seldom left the home, and just now his practice had been neglected on account of Edward's death. Let's take a little break there, I think. Hmm. So, Henry's pretty freaked out, I think. Um. Hmm. I love the, it's quite economically written this, but I really love the mental image of the three sisters across the hallway in one room pretending to sew while Henry rages around this study trying to figure out what's going on with this shadow on the wall. It's creepy. It's creepy. The idea of a shadow that you realise isn't being cast by anything. Mm. Ooh, it's good. Let's check in with the chat. Fran Fry says, I missed all the build-up because I'm on public transportation. Damn you, tunnel. But also, yay for drum lessons. All masked up and safe. Glad to hear it, Fran Fry. Uh, enjoy the drum lessons. That's so exciting. Um, learning to play the drums, that's awesome. Um, how how far along are you, Fran fry with the with the drums let let me know let me know i love playing the drums candle after says yep he's going to die and rune factor says emma i've seen enough where's the wine yeah i really like that I, there's a there's a sense of humor in this story that i'm really enjoying um the uh 
Yeah. Let's find that line again. Yes, there's plenty, said Caroline. You can have some when you go to bed. I think we'd all better take some, said Mrs. Brigham. <laughs> it's good, right? Mm. Mm -hmm -hmm. Ah, some theorising in the chat that the lamp is causing the shadow. That's interesting. That's an interesting theory. Well, let's see if it pays out. Or maybe something more sinister. Okay. Should we bring it home? Blank says, I'm too sober to deal with this. <laughs> Quoting Emma. Yep. Angela Sanchez. Henry practices his ghost fencing in the study. Sisters, let's get drank. <laughs> Just me, Desi13 says, honestly, I really enjoy the dynamic between the sisters. I like it. It feels, um, feels authentic to me. Hmm. Three quite different personalities. I like it. Ah, oh, Fran Fry, uh, of the drumming. Only my fifth lesson, but I'm thrilled and motivated. I love it. That's all. Five lessons in, five lessons in. I reckon you've, uh, the drum, in my experience, the drums are um, hardest right at the beginning. Once you can get your limbs to sort of start moving independently, then the whole the whole instrument just opens up. You can do all sorts and anything, and you you'll you'll find that your learning just increases and accelerates in a really satisfying way. Um, that's great. Pop some headphones in, play along. To some songs. Ah, oh, it's good. Gosh, I wish I had a drum kit in my home. Zach Gross says, thank you again for uh, for continuing this, Luke. You've inspired me to look up some old mystery stories as well. Awesome. Awesome. Um, that's great. Thank you, Zach Gross. Thank you. Um, and Anna Petrovic says, it's pretty much like me and my sister. And I want to know, and actually this is a question generally to all the chat, which sister are you? I feel like there's a BuzzFeed personality uh, quiz in this. I'm Rebecca, the nervous one, who's like, there's ghosts. I don't want to put the lamp there. Mm. Rebecca, hands down, says Charlotte Winwood. Shy Violet says, Rebecca. Rebecca M says, I'm Rebecca. How depressing. I'm Rebecca too. I'm Rebecca, says Jenny Munchkin. Swooping is bad. I'm Rebecca 100%. Everyone is Rebecca. Oh, except an abundance of cats. Who says probably Caroline? <laughs> Rune Factor says, I'm Emma. I need a drink when things get spooky. Okay, all right. So it's Ka it's Rebecca who we're relating to hard. Cool. All right. Let's bring it home. The funeral has taken place. The sisters looked at him with surprise. He very seldom left home, and just now his practice had been neglected on account of Edward's death. "'How can you leave your patients now?' asked Mrs Brigham wonderingly. "'I don't know how to, but there is no other way,' replied Henry easily. "'I have had a telegram from Dr Mitford.' "'Consultation?' inquired Mrs Brigham. "'Of business.' Dr Mitford was an old classmate of his who lived in a neighbouring city, and who occasionally called upon him in the case of a consultation. After he had gone, Mrs Brigham said to Caroline that, after all, Henry had not said that he was going to consult with Dr Mitford, and she thought it very strange. Everything is very strange, said Rebecca with a shudder. What do you mean? inquired Caroline. Nothing, replied Rebecca. Nobody entered the study that day, nor the next. The third day Henry was expected home, but did not arrive, and the last train from the city had come. I call it pretty queer work, said Mrs Brigham. The idea of a doctor leaving his patients at such a time of this, such a time as this, and the idea of a consultation lasting three days? There is no sense in it, and now he's not come. I don't understand it for my part. I don't either, said Rebecca. They were all in the south parlour. There was no light in the study. The door was ajar. Presently, Mrs Brigham rose. 
She could not have told why. Something seemed to impel her, some will outside her own. She went out of the room, again wrapping her rustling skirts round that she might pass noiselessly, and began pushing at the swollen door of the study. She's not got any lamp, said Rebecca in a shaking voice. Caroline, who was writing letters, rose again, took the only remaining lamp in the room, and followed her sister. Rebecca had risen, but she stood trembling, not venturing to follow. The doorbell rang, but the others did not hear it. It was on the south door of the other side of the house from the study. Rebecca, after hesitating until the bell rang the second time, went to the door. She remembered the servant was out. Caroline and her sister Emma entered the study. Caroline set the lamp on the table. They looked at the wall, and there were two shadows. The sisters stood clutching each other, staring at the awful things on the wall. Then Rebecca came in, staggering with a telegram in her hand. Here is a telegram, she gasped. Henry is dead. And that's the end. That's the end. Tidy little ghost story, I think. I love it. Two shadows. <laughs> so no one seem no one in the chat seems uh too sad to see Henry go. <laughs> Zach Ross says I'm glad it ended there. I'm glad it ended there too. Because Henry was rubbish. He's dead. Insane Raven says, the hell? Nah, just went through the roof. <laughs> Sarah Franchella says, that was very good. Dan Clark says, simple but effective. And you know what? You end up with you, Rebecca and Emma and Caroline alone in the house. It's their house now. It's the sister's house now. Cool. It's cool. So in a way, it's kind of a happy ending almost it's a satisfying ending but um yeah good story i think elegant um yeah i enjoyed the economy with which it's told i like that it drops you right in there um a lot of ghost stories that we've been reading have this kind of very long lengthy build-up kind of here is the person here's all the backstory here's their childhood and then they sort of move move slowly towards the story um but i like that this one just drops you straight in it with some dialogue edward's already dead we think henry did it here's my question though what my interpretation and i suppose there are many interpretations but the way i interpret it was that henry was killed by edward somehow henry killed edward and as such edward's creepy shadow remained on the wall vengefully taunting henry killed henry um and then henry ends up on the wall but henry clearly died on this business trip so i don't know do we think edward as a ghost is confined to the wall confined to the house or did he go a wandering what do we think let me know what you think Swooping is bad, says, yay, Rebecca lived. Pity Caroline didn't die, though. Oh, Caroline was just trying to hold it together, you know? Caroline's got that sort of... Caroline's got that sort of heavy lies the crown. I think she's sort of nominally in charge of the gang, so I think she has to be a bit hard. Rebecca M says, time to sell the house and do not disclose the hauntedness. Leon Brooke, thank you very much for the super chat. Says, simple but effectively creepy. Thanks for sharing this with us. Mmm, a good one. A good one. just reading in the chat theories henry definitely also died of gastric too says mr team corvette yeah 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 mm. odd luck says the house holds the shadows of family who died poorly that's my guess 
That's cool. Denise L says, just never bring a light source in the room. Gentleman Drill says, maybe suicide out of guilt, so the shadow is stuck with the person he killed. That would be a very gothic and old-timey Victorian ending. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> So on the plus side, the sisters now get the house to themselves. On the downside, there is one room that they kind of can't go in. Although, I guess it doesn't seem like the shadows are vengefully out to kill them. So, you know, they can just enjoy it. I'd like to echo the, sen the sentiments of uh, Luthien Nenharma, who says, Really enjoyed the way this was written. Much less overly descriptive than most Victorian stories. Really subtle narrator. Yeah, it was good. It was good. It was good. Well, we are about to swap back to some Mr. James, who is much more, um, what's the word? Verbose in his writing. Not shy of a long sentence. Let's let's put it that way. Rune Factor says, why do all three sisters live together if Emma is married? That's a good question. Um, we do know that Emma is married, but we, I don't think we know anything about the husband. But then, you know, maybe there's nothing to know. Maybe, um, maybe Emma has come home to where Caroline and Rebecca live temporarily because, um, because her brother died, because Edward died. Um, perhaps she's widowed. Suggests a uh, secret agent, secret agent Sam. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Laura Dilly says maybe they came together for the funeral. Let's go with that. Let's go with that. But you don't need, um, you don't need to know, you know? It's an economical story. Okay. Right. I think in a moment we will continue. We'll crack on. We'll go with... Uh, the next story, a whistle and I'll come to you, my lad. I like this one. There was a BBC adaptation of this one in, I think, the 70s. It's probably, um, although we've read a bunch of other stories first, I think this one is arguably M.R. James's most famous short story. Um, it's cool. It's cool. So if we enjoyed uh, that author, though, if we enjoyed... Um, the writing of um, Mary Eleanor Wilkins, we can come back to it because, as, as I say, she has written a whole lot of ghost stories. So, but yeah, I really enjoyed reading it. I think it went down even better than I thought it would. So, yeah. Cool. All right, the chat's into it, the chat's into it. Okay. A Whistle and I'll Come to You, My Lad, by M.R. James. Swig from the goblet. <clears throat> Settle in, folks. I hope everyone has taken the opportunity to go get a mug of warm cocoa. Hot cocoa, not warm cocoa. Room temperature red wine. Or um, chilled white wine. Or a goblet of blood, as Shy Violet suggests. If that's what you're into. Here we go. I suppose you will be getting away pretty soon now. Full term is over, Professor, said a person not in the story to the professor of ontography. Soon after, they had sat down next to each other at a feast in the hospitable hall of St. James's College. The professor was young, neat, and precise in speech. Yes, he said, my friends have been making me take up golf this term, and I mean to go to the East Coast. In point of fact, to Burnstow, I dare say you know it, for a week or ten days to improve my game. I hope to get off tomorrow. Oh, Parkins, said his neighbour on the other side. If you are going to Burnstow, I wish you would look at the site of the Templar's Preceptory and let me know if you think it would be any good to have a dig there in the summer. It was, as you might suppose, a person of antiquarian pursuits who said this. But since he merely appears in this prologue, there is no need to give his entitlements. 
Certainly, said Parkins, the professor. If you will describe to me whereabouts the site is, I will do my best to give you an idea of the lie of the land when I get back. Or I could write to you about it if you would tell me where you are likely to be. Don't trouble to do that, thanks. It's only that I'm thinking of taking my family in that direction in the long, and it occurred to me that, as very few of the English preceptories have ever been properly planned, I might have an opportunity of doing something useful on off days. Well, the professor rather sniffed at the idea that planning out a preceptory could be described as useful, but his neighbour continued. The site, I doubt if there is anything showing above ground, must be down quite close to the beach now. The sea has encroached tremendously, as you know, all along that bit of coast. I should think from the map that it must be about three quarters of a mile from the Globe Inn at the north end of town. Where are you going to stay? Well, at the Globe Inn, as a matter of fact, said Parkins. I've engaged a room there. I couldn't get in anywhere else. Most of the lodging houses are shut up in winter, it seems. And as it is, they tell me that the only room of any size I can have is really a double-bedded one and that they haven't a corner in which to store the other bed, and so on. But I must have a fairly large room, for I'm taking some books down, and mean to do a bit of work. And though I don't quite fancy having an empty bed, not to speak of two, in what I may call for the time being my study, I suppose I can manage to rough it for the short time I shall be there. Do you call having an extra bed in your room roughing it, Parkins? said a bluff person opposite. Look here, I shall come down and occupy it, occupy it for a bit. I'll be company for you. The professor quivered, but managed to laugh in a courteous manner. By all means, Rogers, there's nothing I should like better. But I'm afraid you would find it rather dull. You don't play golf, do you? No, thank heaven, said rude Mr. Rogers. Well, you see, when I'm not writing, I shall most likely be out on the links. And that, as I say, would be rather dull for you, I'm afraid. Oh, I don't know. There's certain to be somebody I know in the place. But of course, if you don't want me, speak the word, Parkins. I shan't be offended. Truth, as you always tell us, is never offensive. Parkins was indeed scrupulously polite and strictly truthful. It is to be feared that Mr. Rogers sometimes practised upon his knowledge of these characteristics. In Parkins' breast there was a conflict now raging, which for a moment or two did not allow him to answer. That interval being over, he said, well, if you want the exact truth, Rogers, I was considering whether the room I speak of would really be large enough to accommodate us both comfortably. And also whether, mind I shouldn't have said this if you hadn't pressed me, you would not constitute something in the nature of a hindrance to my work. Rogers laughed loudly. Ha! Well done, Parkins, he said. It's all right. I promise not to interrupt your work. Don't you disturb yourself about that. No, I won't come if you don't want me, but I thought I should do so nicely to keep the ghosts off. Here he might have been seen to wink and to nudge his next neighbour. Parkins might also have been seen to become pink. I beg pardon, Parkins, Rogers continued. I oughtn't to have said that. I forgot you don't like levity on these topics. Well, Parkins said, as you have mentioned the matter, I freely own that I do not like careless talk about what you call ghosts. A man in my position, he went on, raising his voice a little, cannot, I find, be too careful about appearing to sanction the current beliefs on such subjects. As you know, Rogers, or as you ought to know, for I think I have never concealed my views. No, you certainly have not, old man, put in Rogers. I hold that any semblance, any appearance of concession to the view that such things might exist is equivalent to a renunciation of all that I hold most sacred but I'm afraid I have not succeeded in securing your attention. Your undivided attention was what Dr. Blimber actually said, Rogers interrupted with every appearance of an earnest desire for accuracy. But I beg your pardon, Parkins, I'm stopping you. No, not at all, said Parkins. I don't remember Blimber, maybe perhaps he was before my time, but I needn't go on, I'm sure you know what I mean. Yes, yes, said Rogers rather hastily, just so. We'll go into it fully at Burnstow or somewhere. In repeating the above dialogue, I have tried to give the impression, which it made on me, that Parkins was something of an old woman, rather hen-like perhaps in his little ways, totally destitute, alas, of the sense of humour, but at the same time dauntless and sincere in his convictions, and a man deserving of the greatest respect. Whether or not the reader has gathered so much, that was the character which Parkins had. Let's take a break. 
<laughs> what do we think of um what do we think of uh what do we think of rogers <laughs> so rude just inviting himself on the holiday that is the nightmare scenario oh man imagine that you're just you just casually mention you just casually mention oh funny thing there's actually an extra room he's like oh i'll come no rogers you were not invited. Joel Smith says, I can't believe the hen-like description. Mm. Yeah, that was an odd description, wasn't it? I mean, you know, telling of the time. Parkins is described as something of an old woman, rather hen-like, perhaps, in his little ways. Yeah. Nevermore Raven says, considering the time period, the height of rudeness. Hmm. Yeah, just inviting yourself along. What do we think about my Rogers voice, by the way? I just committed to it in the moment. I didn't really think it through. <laughs> I hope it's not peaking the microphone too much. I hope it's coming through all right. Uh, Lucy Harvey Plymouth says, Love the old English jock voice. Really adds to the character vibe. Yeah. And Fran Fry says, Rogers, read the room. Yep, 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 yep. Mm. Poor Parkins. He's trying to have a golf holiday. And, um, yeah. Now Rogers is coming. <laughs> Michelle says, Rogers would want it to peak the mic. Yeah, he would. He would. That's, that's Rogers for you. So, we have our characters. We have Parkins. Fastidious. No sense of humour but very much to be respected. And we have Rogers. Rogers! I don't know how much more we will see of Rogers. Let's keep going. On the following day, Parkins did, as he had hoped, succeed in getting away from his college and in arriving at Burnstow. He was made welcome at the Globe Inn, was safely installed in the large double-bedded room of which we have heard, and was able to order, before retiring, an apple pie upon a commodious table which occupied the outer end of the room, and to arrange his materials for work. The room was surrounded on three sides by windows looking out seaward, that is to say the central window looked straight out to sea, and those on the left and right commanded prospects along the shore to the north and south respectively. On the south you saw the village of Burnstow, on the north, no houses were to be seen, but only the beach and the low cliff backing it. Immediately in front was a strip, not considerable, of rough grass dotted with old anchors, capstans and so forth. Then a broad path, and then the beach. Whatever may have been the original distance between the Globe Inn and the sea, not more than 60 yards now separated them. The rest of the population of the inn was, of course, a golfing one, and included few elements that call for a special description. The most conspicuous figure was perhaps that of an ancien militaire, secretary of a London club, and possessed of a voice of incredible strength, and of views of a pronouncedly Protestant type. These were apt to find utterance after his attendance upon the ministrations of the vicar, an estimable man with an inclin with inclinations towards a picturesque ritual, which he gallantly kept down as far as he could out of deference to East Anglian tradition. Professor Parkins, one of whose principal characteristics was pluck, spent the greater part of the day following his arrival at Burnstow in what he had called improving his game, in company with this Colonel Wilson. And during the afternoon, whether the process of improving were to blame or not, I am not sure, the colonel's demeanour assumed a colouring so lurid that even Parkins jibbed at the thought of walking home with him from the links. He determined, after a short and furtive look at that bristling moustache and those incar <laughs> incarnadine features, that it would be wiser to allow the influences of tea and tobacco to do what they could with the colonel before the dinner hour should render a meeting inevitable. I might walk home tonight along the beach, he reflected. Yes, and uh, take a look, there will be light enough for that, at the ruins of which Disney was talking. I don't exactly know where they are, by the way, but I expect I can hardly help stumbling on them. 
This he accomplished, I may say, in the most literal sense, for in picking his way from the links to the shingle beach, his foot caught, partly in a gorse root and partly in a biggish stone, and over he went. When he got up and surveyed his surroundings, he found himself in a patch of somewhat broken ground covered with small depressions and mounds. These latter, when he came to examine them, proved to be simply masses of flints embedded in mortar and grown over with turf. He must, he quite rightly concluded, be on the site of the preceptory he had promised to look at. It seemed not unlikely to reward the spade of the explorer. Enough of the foundations were probably left at no great depth to throw a good deal of light on the general plan. He remembered vaguely that the Templars to whom this site had belonged were in the habit of building round churches, and he thought a particular series of the humps or mounds near him did appear to be arranged in something of a circular form. Few people can resist the temptation to try a little amateur research in a department quite outside their own, if only for the satisfaction of showing how successful they would have been had they only taken it up seriously. Our professor, however, if he felt something of this mean desire, was also truly anxious to oblige his friend. So he paced with care the circular area he had noticed, and wrote down its rough dimensions in his pocketbook. Then he proceeded to examine an oblong eminence, which lay east of the centre of the circle, and seemed, to his thinking, likely to be the base of a platform or altar. At one end of it, the northern, a patch of the turf was gone, removed by some boy or other creature ferre naturae. It might, he thought, be as well to probe the soil here for evidences of masonry, and he took out his knife and began scraping away the earth. And now followed another little discovery. A portion of soil fell inward as he scraped and disclosed a small cavity. He lighted one match after another to help him to see of what nature the hole was, but the wind was too strong for them all. By tapping and scratching the sides with his knife, however, he was able to make out that it must be an artificial hole in masonry. It was rectangular, and the sides, top and bottom, if not actually plastered, were smooth and regular. Of course it was empty. No. As he withdrew the knife, he heard a metallic clink, and when he introduced his hand, it met with a cylindrical object lying on the floor of the hole. Naturally enough, he picked it up, and when he brought it to the light, now fast fading, he could see that it too was of man's making, a metal tube about four inches long, and evidently of some considerable age. By the time Parkins had made sure there was nothing else in the odd receptacle, it was too late and too dark for him to think of undertaking any further search. What he had done uh, had proved so unexpectedly interesting that he determined to sacrifice a little more of the daylight on the morrow to archaeology. The object, which he now held safe in his pocket, was bound to be of some slight value at least, he felt sure. Bleak and solemn was the view on which he took a last look before starting homeward. A faint yellow light in the west showed the links, on which a few figures moving towards the clubhouse were still visible. The squat Martello Tower, the lights of Aldsey Village, the pale ribbon of sands intersecting at intervals by black wooden groinings, the dim and murmuring sea. The wind was bitter from the north, but was at his back when he set out for the globe. He quickly rattled and clashed through the shingle and gained the sand, upon which, but for the groinings which had to be got over every few yards, the going was both good and quiet. One last look behind, to measure the distance he had made since leaving the ruined Templar's church, showed him a prospect of company on his walk, in the shape of a rather indistinct personage, who seemed to be making great efforts to catch up with him, but made little, if any, progress. I mean that there was an appearance of running about his movements, but that the distance between him and Parkins did not seem materially to lessen. So, at least, Parkins thought and decided that he almost certainly did not know him, and that it would be absurd to wait until he came up. For all that, company, he began to think, would really be very welcome on that lonely shore, if only you could choose your companion. In his unenlightened days, he had read of meetings in such places, which even now would hardly bear thinking of. He went on thinking of them, however, until he reached home, and particularly one of one which catches most people's fancy at some time of their childhood. 
Now I saw in my dream that Christian had gone but a very little way when he saw a foul fiend coming over the field to meet him. What should I do now, he thought, if I looked back and caught sight of a black figure sharply defined against the yellow sky, and saw that it had horns and wings? I wonder whether I should stand or run for it. Luckily, the gentleman behind is not of that kind, and he seems to be about as far off now as when I first saw him. Well, at this rate, he won't get his dinner as soon as I shall, and dear me, it's within a quarter of an hour of the time. I must run. Parkins had, in fact, very little time for dressing. When he met the colonel at dinner, peace, or as much of her as that gentleman could manage, reigned once more in the military bosom. Nor was she put to flight in the hours of bridge that followed dinner, for Parkins was a more than respectable player. When, therefore, he retired towards twelve o'clock, he felt that he had spent his evening in quite a satisfactory way and that, even for so long as a fortnight or three weeks, life at the Globe would be supportable under similar conditions. Especially, thought he, if I go on improving my game. As he went along the passages, he met the boots of the Globe. He, sorry, he met the boots of the Globe, who stopped and said, Beg your pardon, sir, but as I was brushing your coat just now, there was something fell out of the pocket. Put it on your chest of drawers, sir, in your room, sir. A piece of a pipe or something like that, sir. Thank you, sir. You'll find it on your chest of drawers, sir. Yes, sir. Good night, sir. Let's take a break. So. Parkins has gone from golf to... A little bit of archaeology, and what's he found? A little cylindrical metal thing. What is that? We don't know. Um, and then on his walk back to his hotel... Hmm. Hmm. A figure following. That was quite the description, wasn't it? Uh... A figure that seemed to be running, but was never catching up. Hmm, hmm, hmm. <laughs> Laura Dealey says, Bet it was Roger on the beach not getting the hint. <laughs> yeah. I would also note that uh, Parkins has made a friend. This uh, Colonel Wilson, who was described as having an extremely loud and brash voice, um, which I didn't really think through before I started reading this story. So, um, yeah, well, I'm just going to go for it. I'm just going to go for it. I'd hope it doesn't massively undercut the mood. <laughs> okay. Let us know in the chat if uh, we're ready to crack on. Um, or if we want to take a little break, do we want to, we want to take a break or are we, we good to go? What do we think? What do we think? Do we need bathroom breaks? Should we crack on? What do you think? Canned laughter says, apparently this guy doesn't understand that when you are being chased by a potential Cthulhu monster after stealing, <laughs> after stealing from a tomb. Mm. Well, we don't know it was a tomb. We don't know what it was. I'm just topping up my water. For indeed it is just water and not blood in the goblet. All right. Crack on. So, the boot, which is the name of the um, employee at the Globe, has just uh, reminded him that he's put his discovery on his chest of drawers. The speech served to remind Parkins of his little discovery of that afternoon. It was with some considerable curiosity that he turned it over by the light of his candles. It was of bronze, he now saw, and was shaped very much after the manner of the modern dog whistle. In fact, it was. Yes, certainly it was. Actually, no more nor less than a whistle. He put it to his lips, but it was quite full of a fine caked up sand or earth which would not yield to knocking but must be loosened with a knife tidy as ever in his habit parkins cleared out the earth onto a piece of paper and took the latter to the window to empty it out 
The night was clear and bright, as he saw when he had opened the casement, and he stopped for an instant to look at the sea and note a belated wanderer stationed on the shore in front of the inn. Then he shut the window, a little surprised at the late hours people kept in Burnstow, and took his whistle to the light again. Why, surely there were marks on it, not merely marks but letters. A very little rubbing rendered the deeply cut inscription quite legible, but the professor had to confess, after some earnest thought, that the meaning of it was as obscure to him as the writing on the wall to Belshazzar. There were legends both on the front and of the back of the whistle. The one read thus, Fla, fur, bis, flay. The other, Quis est iste qui venit. I ought to be able to make it out, he thought, but I suppose I am a little rusty in my Latin. When it comes to think of it, I don't believe I even know the word for a whistle. The long one does not seem simple enough. It ought to mean, Who is this who is coming? Well, the best way to find out is evidently to whistle for him. He blew tentatively and stopped suddenly, startled and yet pleased at the note he had elicited. It had a quality of infinite distance in it, and, soft as it was, he somehow felt it must be audible for miles around. It was a sound, too, that seemed to have the power which many scents possess, of forming pictures in the brain. He saw quite clearly for a moment a vision of a wide, dark expanse at night, with a fresh wind blowing, and in the midst a very lonely figure. How employed he could not tell. Perhaps he would have seen more, had not the picture been broken by the sudden surge of a gust of wind against his casement, so sudden that it made him look up, just in time to see the white glint of a seabird's wing somewhere outside the dark panes. The sound of the whistle had so fascinated him that he could not help trying it once more this time more boldly. The note was little, if at all, louder than before, and repetition broke the illusion. No pictures followed, as he had half hoped it might. But what is this? Goodness, what force the wind can get up in a few minutes! What a tremendous gust! There, I, I knew that window fastening was no use! Ah, I thought so! Both candles out! It is enough to tear the room to pieces! The first thing was to get the window shut. While you might count twenty, Parkins was struggling with the small casement, and felt almost as if he were pushing back a sturdy burglar, so strong was the pressure. It slackened all at once, and the window banged to and latched itself. Now to relight the candles and see what damage, if any, had been done. No, nothing seemed amiss. No glass even was broken in the casement. But the noise had evidently roused at least one member of the household. The colonel was to be heard stumping in his stockinged feet on the floor above and growling. Quickly as, it, quickly as it had risen, the wind did not fall at once. On it went, moaning and rushing past the house, at times rising to a cry so desolate that, as Parkins disinterestedly said, it might have made fanciful pe people feel quite uncomfortable. Even the unimaginative, he thought, after a quarter of an hour, might be happier without it. Whether it was the wind or the excitement of golf or of the researches in the preceptory that kept Parkins awake, he was not sure. Awake he remained in any case, long enough to fancy, as I am afraid I often do myself under such conditions, that he was the victim of all manner of fatal disorders. He would lie, counting the beats of his heart, convinced that it was going to stop work every moment, and would entertain grave suspicions of his lungs, brain, liver, etc. Suspicions he was sure would be dispelled by the return of daylight, but which until then refused to be put aside. He found a little vicarious comfort in the idea that someone else was in the same boat. A near neighbour, in the darkness it was not easy to tell his direction, was tossing and rustling in his bed too. The next stage was that Parkins shut his eyes and determined to give sleep every chance. Here again, over-excitement asserted itself in another form, that of making pictures. Experto crede, pictures do come to the closed eyes of one trying to sleep, and are often so little to his taste that he must open his eyes and disperse them. Parkin's experience on this occasion was a very distressing one. He found that the picture which presented itself to him was continuous. When he opened his eyes, of course it went, but when he shut them once more it framed itself afresh, and acted itself out again, neither quicker nor slower than before. 
and what he saw was this. A long stretch of shore, shingle edged by sand, and intersected at short intervals with black groinings running down to the water. A scene, in fact, so like that of his afternoon's walk that in the absence of any landmark, it could not be distinguished therefrom. The light was obscure, conveying an impression of gathering storm, late winter evening and slight cold rain. On this bleak stage, at first, no actor was visible. Then in the distance, a bobbing, black object appeared. A moment more, and it was a man, running, jumping, clambering over the groinings, and every few seconds looking eagerly back. The nearer he came, the more obvious it was that he was not only anxious, but even terribly frightened, though his face was not to be distinguished. He was, moreover, almost at the end of his strength. When he came, each successive obstacle seemed to cause him more difficulty than the last. Will he get over this next one, thought Parkins. It seems a little higher than the others. Yes, half climbing, half throwing himself, he did get over, and fell all in a heap on the other side, the side nearest to the spectator. There, as if really unable to get up again, he remained crouching under the groinings, looking up in an attitude of painful anxiety. So far, no cause whatever for the fear of the runner had been shown, but now there began to be seen, far up the shore, a little flicker of something light-coloured moving to and fro with great swiftness and irregularity. Rapidly growing larger, it too declared itself as a figure in pale, fluttering draperies, ill-defined. There was something about its motion which made Parkins very unwilling to see it at close quarters. It would stop, raise arms, bow itself towards the sand, then run, stooping across the beach to the water edge and back again, and then, rising upright, once more continue its course forward at a speed that was startling and terrifying. The moment came when the pursuer was hovering about from left to right, only a few yards beyond the groinings where the runner lay in hiding. After two or three ineffectual castings hither and thither, it came to a stop, stood upright, with arms raised high, and then darted straight forward towards the groinings. It was at this point that Parkins always failed in his resolution to keep his eyes shut. With many misgivings as to incipient failure of eyesight, overworked brain, excessive smoking, and so on, he finally resigned himself to light his candle, get out a book, and pass the night waking, rather than be tormented by this persistent panorama, which he saw clearly enough could only be a morbid reflection of his walk and his thoughts on that very day. The scraping of match on box and the glare of light must have startled some creature of the night, rats or what not, which he heard scurry across the floor from the side of his bed with much rustling. Dear, dear, the match is out, fool that it is. But the second one burnt better and a candle and book were duly procured, over which Parkins poured till sleep of a wholesome kind came upon him, and that in no long space. For about the first time in his orderly and prudent life he forgot to blow out the candle, and when he was called next morning at eight, there was still a flicker in the socket and a sad mess of gutted grease on the top of the little table. Let's take a break. Hmm. Hmm. Rebecca M says, Welp, brains haunted. Yeah, let's talk about that extremely unpleasant description of insomnia. Um, something as well, perhaps... Um, of uh, um, medical anxieties in that description of um, like lying in bed obsessively worrying that some part of your body is about to fail like your heart's just going to stop randomly um, yeah mm. yeah I mean I can I can yeah I can relate to that I have, yeah, I have anxiety and OCD stuff going on, and and yeah, there was that um, that description really sort of hit home with me. That like description of of, uh, of like insomnia, of that kind of like anxiety. Obviously, Parkins is suffering from a haunting, um, but I I find that there's something um, there's something I always find quite chilling about like reading a very very old description of something really relatable does that make sense i don't know if that makes sense but yeah i thought that that description of not being able to sleep was quite striking and really creepy um i found that really unsettling mm. 
<laughs> uh, Rebecca M says, yeah, the anxiety brain description was way too close to life for me. Mm, 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 mm. Scary. Um, also, let's talk about, well, a few things to talk about. That, okay, how, mm. how creepy is the idea that when you close your eyes, you see something very clearly, and when you open them, it goes away, but when you close your eyes, that same scene starts replaying? That is a freaky concept, and I am not down with it at all. Hmm. Hmm. No, 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 no. Not a fan of that. Also, um, something quite scary about the fact that every time he does close his eyes and this sort of like movie starts playing in his eyes, um, there's he, he sort of has to stop at the same point every time, the point where this ghostly figure gets to its prey, gets to its target on the beach. I also like the description of the running, the way this ghost is moving. Um... Yeah, sort of bobbing up and down, raising its arms and then kind of running at random. Creepy, 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 creepy. Mm. <laughs> Angela Sanchez says, yep, that's the bit that really got me. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm. Beth Bloomer says, horror and the occult are often used in old stories to explain common things like insomnia and anxiety. I suppose, yeah, potentially at the time. Yeah, maybe there you go. That casual dragon says, I was actually afraid of what turned out to be my own heartbeat for a long time as a child. Hmm. Hmm, hmm, hmm. Hannah Marin says, love how you sort of acted out the creature's motions, Luke. Yeah. <laughs> scary, scary, scary. Oh, NimbleTac says, I have severe OCD. It tends to give me fears about making mistakes that will hurt others, so I'm over careful and check things over and over. Yeah, that is um, that is relatable. NimbleTac, Nimble hope you're doing all right. Um, wish you all the best. Um, <laughs> and Zonk says, I imagined the shadow was Naruto running. <laughs> you know that Naruto run with the arms out at the back? <laughs> yeah that could um <laughs> okay well now i'm imagining that <laughs> now i'm imagining that and i don't know if that's made it more frightening or less frightening mm, 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 mm. rune factor says i don't even feel scared of the ghost anymore after picturing it naruto running yep there we go there we go on oh, nimble tax says thanks i'm okay good glad to hear it Mm. Okay, so, so far, this story is creepy, a little too relatable, and we haven't even got to the major haunting yet. Let's kick, let's, let's crack on. Oh, gosh, I think we're about to meet the Colonel. Okay. Oh, just before we go. Uh, another super chat. Thank you from Fran Fry. He says, by the way, I made a simple designy artsy thing for hashtag remain unhaunted. It's not that com complex, but I'd love for you to know about it anyway. Ah, oh, thanks, Fran Fry. That's cool. Um, I don't know if you're on Twitter or, or Instagram, but that's probably the best way to um, uh, to to show me stuff. Um, yeah, uh, tag me and I tag me and I will see it. Um, yeah, cool. Well, thank you, thank you. That's awesome. Designy artsy thing. I love it. Oh, and Charlotte Winwood says, sending love to my fellow anxiety slash obsessive compulsive tendency sufferers. Yeah. Yeah. All good vibes. All good vibes. May you be comfortable with uncertainty. Right. Let's not get too deep, shall we? Let's crack on. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> Lindsay Langdon says, make him blathers, lol. Yeah, I think this is probably going to be... I'm just assuming many of you in the chat have seen my Animal Crossing live streams. For which I do a blather's voice. Okay, all right. <laughs> okay. After breakfast, he was in his room, putting the finishing touches to his golfing costume. Fortune had again allotted the colonel to him for a partner when one of the maids came in. 
Oh, if you please, she said, would you like any extra blankets on your bed, sir? Ah, thank you, said Parkins. Yes, I think I should like one. It, it seems likely to turn rather colder. In a very short time, the maid was back with the blanket. Uh, which bed should I put it on, sir? She asked. What? Why, that one, the one I slept in last night, he said, pointing to it. Oh, yes, I beg your pardon, sir, but you seem to have tried both of them. Leastways, we had to make them both up this morning. Really? How very absurd, said Parkins. I certainly never touched the other, except to lay some things on it. Did it actually seem to have been slept in? Oh, yes, sir, said the maid. Why, all the things was crumpled and thrown about always, if you'll excuse me, sir. Quite as if anyone hadn't passed but a very poor night, sir. Dear me, said Parkins. Well, I may have disordered it more than I thought when I unpacked my things. I'm very sorry to have given you the extra trouble, I'm sure. I expect a friend of mine soon, by the way, a gentleman from Cambridge, to come and occupy it for a night or two. That will be all right, I suppose, won't it? Oh, yes, to be sure, sir. Thank you, sir. It's no trouble, I'm sure, said the maid, and departed to giggle with her colleagues. Parkin set forth with a stern determination to improve his game. I am glad to be able to report that he succeeded so far in this enterprise that the colonel, who had been rather repining at the prospect of a second day's play in his company, became quite chatty as the morning advanced, and his voice boomed out over the flats, as certain also of our own minor poets have said, like some great borden in a minister tower. Extraordinary wind that we had last night, he said. In my old home, we should have said someone had been whistling for it. Should you indeed, said Perkins. Is there a superstition of that kind still current in your part of the country? Well, I don't know about superstition, said the colonel. They believe it in all over Denmark and Norway, as well as on the Yorkshire coast. Uh, my experience is, mind you, there's generally something at the bottom of what these country folk hold to, and have held to for generations. But it's your drive. Or whatever it might have been, the golfing reader will have to imagine appropriate digressions at the proper intervals. When conversation was resumed, Parkin said with a slight hesitancy, uh, Apropos of what you were saying just now, Colonel, I think I ought to tell you that my own views on such subjects are very strong. I am in fact a convinced disbeliever in what is called the supernatural. What? said the Colonel. Do you mean to tell me you don't believe in second sight or ghosts or anything of that kind? Did nothing whatever of that kind, returned Parkins firmly. Well, said the Colonel. But it appears to me at that rate, sir, that you must be little better than a Sadducee. Parkins was at the point of answering that, in his opinion, the Sadducees were the most sensible persons he had ever read of in the Old Testament. But feeling some doubt as to whether much mention of them was to be found in that work, he preferred to laugh the accusation of. <laughs> Perhaps I am, he said. But, uh, here, give me my clique, boy. Excuse me one moment, Colonel. A short interval. Now, as to uh, whistling for the wind, let me give you my theory about it. The laws which govern winds are really not at all perfectly known to fisher folk and such. Of course, not known at all. A man or woman of eccentric habits, perhaps, or a stranger, is seen repeatedly on the beach at some unusual hour and is heard whistling. Soon afterwards, a violent wind rises. A man who could read the sky perfectly or who possessed a barometer could have foretold that it would. The simple people of a fishing village have no barometers and only a few rough rules for prophesying weather. What more natural than that that what more natural than that the eccentric personage I postulated should be regarded as having raised the wind or that he or she should clutch eagerly at the reputation of being able to do so. Now, take last night's wind as it happens, I myself was whistling. I blew a whistle twice and the wind seemed to come absolutely in answer to my call. If anyone had seen me. The audience had been a little restive under this harangue, and Parkins had, I fear, fallen somewhat into the tone of a lecturer. But at the last sentence, the colonel stopped. Whistling, were you? He said. What sort of whistle did you use? Play this stroke first. Interval. A about that whistle you were asking, colonel, it's a rather curious one. I have it in my... Oh, no, I've, I've left it in my room. As a matter of fact, I found it yesterday. And then Parkins narrated the manner of his discovery of the whistle, upon hearing which the colonel grunted, and opined that, in Parkins' place, he should himself be careful about using a thing that had belonged to a set of papists, of whom, speaking generally, it might be affirmed that you never knew what they might not have been up to. 
From this topic, he diverged to the enormities of the vicar, who had given notice on the previous Sunday that Friday would be the Feast of St. Thomas the Apostle, and that there would be service at 11 o'clock in the church. This and other similar proceedings constituted, in the colonel's view, a strong presumption that the vicar was a concealed papist, if not a Jesuit, and Parkins, who could not very readily follow the colonel in this region, did not disagree with him. In fact, they got on so well together in the morning that there was not talk on either side of their separating after lunch. Both continued to play well during the afternoon, or at least well enough to make them forget everything else until the light began to fail them. Not until then did Parkins remember that he had meant to do some more investigating at the preceptory. But it was of no great importance, he reflected. One day was as good as another. He might as well go home with the colonel. As they turned the corner of the house, the colonel was almost knocked down by a boy who rushed into him at the very top of his speed, and then, instead of running away, remained hanging on to him and panting. The first words of the warrior were naturally those of reproof and objurgation, but he very quickly discerned that the boy was almost speechless with fright. Inquiries were useless at first. When the boy got his breath, he began to howl and still clung to the colonel's legs. He was at last detached, but continued to howl. "'What in the world is the matter with you? What have you been up to? What have you seen?' said the colonel. "'I have seen it with me out the window,' wailed the boy, "'and I don't like it.' "'What window?' said the irritated colonel. "'Come, pull yourself together, my boy!' "'The front window it was at the hotel,' said the boy. At this point, Parkins was in favour of sending the boy home, but the colonel refused. He wanted to get to the bottom of it, he said. It was most dangerous to give a boy such a fright as this one had had, and if it turned out that people had been playing jokes, they should suffer for it in some way. And by a series of questions, he made out this story. The boy had been playing about on the grass in front of the globe with some others. Then they had gone home to their teas, and he was just going when he happened to look up at the front window and see it a-waving at him. It seemed to be a figure of some sort in white as far as he knew. Couldn't see its face, but it waved at him, and it wasn't a right thing. Not to say not a not a right person. Was there a light in the room? No, he didn't think to look if there was a light. Which was the window? Was it the top one or the second one? The second one it was, the big window, which has got two little ends at the sides. Very well, my boy, said the colonel after a few more questions. You run away home now. I expect it was some person trying to give you a start. Another time, like a brave English boy, you just throw a stone. Uh, well, no, not that exactly, but but go and speak to the waiter or to Mr. Simpson, the landlord. And, and, and yes, say that I advised you to do so. The boy's face expressed some of the doubt he felt as to the likelihood of Mr. Simpson's lending a favourable ear to his complaint. But the colonel did not appear to perceive this, and went on, And here's a sixpence. No, I see it's a shilling. And you'll be off home. Don't think any more about it. The youth hurried off with agitated thanks, and the colonel and Parkins went round to the front of the globe and reconnoitred. There was only one window answering to the description they had been hearing. Well, that's curious, said Parkins. It's evidently my window the lad was talking about. Will you come up for a moment, Colonel Wilson? We ought to be able to see if anyone has been taking liberties in my room. They were soon in the passage, and Parkins made as if to open the door. Then he stopped and felt in his pockets. This is more serious than I thought, was his next remark. I remember now that before I started this morning, I locked the door. It is locked now, and what is more, here is the key. And he held it up. Now, he went on. If the servants are in the habit of going into one's room during the day when one is away, I can only say that, well, that I don't approve of it at all. Conscious of a somewhat weak climax, he busied himself in opening the door, which was indeed locked, and in lighting candles. No, he said, nothing seems disturbed. Except your bed, put in the colonel. I Excuse me, that isn't my bed, said Parkins. I don't use that one. But it does look as if someone had been playing tricks with it. It certainly did. Clothes were bundled up and twisted together in a most tortuous confusion. Parkins pondered. That must be it, he said at last. I disordered the clothes last night in unpacking, and they haven't made it since. Perhaps they came in to make it, and that boy saw them through the window. And then they were called away and locked the door after them. Yes, I, th I think that must be it. Well, ring and ask, 
said the colonel, and this appeal to Parkins as practical. The maid appeared, and, to make a long story short, deposed that she had made the bed the morning, in the morning when the gentleman was in the room, and hadn't been there since. No, she hadn't got any other key. Mr Simpson, he kept the keys. He'd be able to tell the gentleman if anyone had been up. This was a puzzle. Investigation showed that nothing of value had been taken, and Parkins remembered the disposition of the small objects on tables and so forth well enough to be pretty sure that no pranks had been played with them. Mr and Mrs Simpson furthermore agreed that neither of them had given the duplicate key of the room to any person whatever during the day. Nor could Parkins, fair-minded man as he was, detect anything in the demeanour of master, mistress or maid that indicated guilt. He was much more inclined to think that the boy had been imposing on the colonel. The latter was unwontedly silent and pensive at dinner, and throughout the evening. When he bade good night to Parkins, he murmured in a gruff undertone, You know where I am if you want me during the night. Why, yes, thank you, Colonel Wilson, I think I do, but there isn't much prospect of my disturbing you, I hope. By the way, he added, did I show you that old whistle I spoke of? I think not. Well, here it is. The Colonel turned it over gingerly in the light of the candle. Can you make anything of the inscription? He asked Parkins, as he took it back. Hmm. No, not in this light. What do you mean to do with it? Well, when I get back to Cambridge, I shall submit it to some of the archaeologists there and see what they think of it. And very likely, if they consider it worth having, I may present it to one of the museums. Hmm, said the Colonel. Well, you may be right. All I know is that if it were mine, I should chuck it straight into the sea. It's no use talking, I'm well aware, but I expect that with you it's a case of live and learn. I hope so, I'm sure, and I wish you a good night. He turned away, leaving Parkins in act to speak at the bottom of the stair, and soon each was in his own bedroom. By some unfortunate accident, there were neither blinds nor curtains to the windows of the professor's room. The previous night he had thought little of this, but tonight there seemed every prospect of a bright moon rising to shine directly on his bed, and probably wake him later on. When he noticed this, he was a good deal annoyed, but with an ingenuity which I can only envy, he succeeded in rigging up, with the help of a railway rug, some safety pins, and a stick and umbrella, a screen which, if it only held together, would completely keep the moonlight off his bed. And shortly afterwards, he was comfortably in that bed. When he had read a somewhat solid work long enough to produce a decided wish to sleep, he cast a drowsy glance around the room, blew out the candle, and fell back upon the pillow. He must have slept soundly for an hour or more, when a sudden clatter shook him up in a most unwelcome manner. In a moment he realised what had happened. His carefully constructed screen had given way, and a very bright frosty moon was shining directly on his face. This was highly annoying. Could he possibly get up and reconstruct the screen, or could he manage to sleep if he did not? For some minutes he lay and pondered over all the possibilities, then he turned over sharply, and with his eyes open lay breathlessly listening. There had been a movement, he was sure, in the empty bed on the opposite side of the room. Tomorrow he would have it moved, for there must be rats or something playing about in it. It was quiet now. No. The commotion began again. There was a rustling and a shaking, surely more than any rat could cause. I can figure to myself something of the Professor's bewilderment and horror, for I have in a dream thirty years back seen the same thing happen. But the reader will hardly perhaps imagine how dreadful it was to him to see a figure suddenly sit up in what he had known was an empty bed. He was out of his own bed in one bound, I made a dash towards the window, where lay his only weapon, the stick with which he had propped up his screen. This was, as it turned out, the worst thing he could have done, because the personage in the empty bed, with a sudden smooth motion, slipped from the bed and took up a position, with outspread arms, between the two beds and in front of the door. Parkins watched it in a horrid perplexity. Somehow the idea of getting past it and escaping through the door was intolerable to him. He could not have borne, he didn't know why, to touch it. And as for its touching him, 
he would sooner dash himself through the window than have that happen. It stood for the moment in a band of dark shadow, and he had not seen what its face was like. Now it began to move, in a stooping posture. And all at once the spectator realised, with some horror and some relief, that it must be blind, for it seemed to feel about it with its muffled arms in a groping and random fashion. Turning half away from him, it became suddenly conscious of the bed he had just left and darted towards it and bent and felt over the pillows in a way which made Parkin shudder as he had never in his life thought possible. In a very few moments it seemed to know that the bed was empty and then, moving forward into the area of light and facing the window, it showed for the first time what manner of thing it was. Parkins, who very much dislikes being questioned about it, did once describe something of it in my hearing, and I gathered that what he chiefly remembers about it is a horrible, and intensely horrible, face of crumpled linen. What expression he read upon it he could not or would not tell, but that the fear of it went nigh to maddening him is certain. But he was not at leisure to watch it for long. With formidable quickness it moved into the middle of the room, and as it groped and waved, one corner of its drapery swept across Parkins's face. He could not, though he knew how perilous a sound was, he could not keep back a cry of disgust, and this gave the searcher an instant clue. It leapt towards him upon the instant, and the next moment he was halfway through the window backwards, uttering cry upon cry at the utmost pitch of his voice, and the linen face was thrust close into his own. At this, almost the last possible second, deliverance came. As you will have guessed, the colonel burst the door open, and was just in time to see the dreadful group at the window. When he reached the figures, only one was left. Parkins sank forward into the room in a faint, and before him on the floor lay a tumbled heap of bedclothes. Colonel Wilson asked no questions, but busied himself in keeping everyone else out of the room, and in getting Parkins back to his bed, and himself, wrapped in a rug, occupied the other bed for the rest of the night. Early on the next day, Rogers arrived, more welcome than he would have been a day before, and the three of them held a very long consultation in the professor's room. At the end of it, the colonel left the hotel door carrying a small object between his finger and thumb, which he cast as far into the sea as a very brawny arm could send it. Later on, the smoke of a burning ascended from the back premises of the globe. Exactly what explanation was patched up for the staff and visitors at the hotel, I must confess, I do not recollect. The professor was somehow cleared of the ready suspicion of delirium tremens, and the hotel of the reputation of a troubled house. There is not much question as to what would have happened to Parkins if the colonel had not intervened when he did. He would either have fallen out of the window or else lost his wits. But it is not so evident what more the creature that came in answer to the whistle could have done than frighten. There seemed to be absolutely nothing material about it save the bedclothes of which it had made itself a body. The colonel, who remembered a not very dissimilar occurrence in India, was of the opinion that if Parkins had closed with it, it could really have done very little, and that its one power was that of frightening. The whole thing, he said, served to confirm his opinion of the Church of Rome. There is really nothing more to tell. But as you may imagine, the professor's views on certain points are less clear-cut than they used to be. His nerves, too, have suffered. He cannot even now see a surplus hanging on a door quite unmoved, and the spectacle of a scarecrow in a field late on a winter afternoon has cost him more than one sleepless night. And that is the end. That is the end. That is the end. Well... Where to begin? Um, hmm. Well, firstly, I thought that was cool. I like the um, I like the actual moment of haunting there. I like the description of the blind linen face thing. If anyone's seen the Muppets Christmas Carol, um, the ghost of Christmas yet to come. That's kind of what I was picturing. Just like a really frightening twisted up mess of sheets and stuff Blech. Blech. linen face i think it's the blindness that the sort of like and the way that it it's described as like detecting the bed that that parkins has just left and it 
is just sort of immediately on it and pouring over it. Wah, horrible. And then realizing it's empty. So like just the just the, just the little behaviors that just imply an intelligence, I think, is what sort of creeps me out. So that's the first thing. I think that actual haunting is creepy. <laughs> Kaiser of Dark Light says, F this, I'm out. <laughs> yep. Some good, re some good reactions if I scroll back in the chat. Nope, 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 no. <laughs> Throw a rock. <laughs> Use golf clubs. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> mm. Creepy. I like the fact that the ghost was trying to, like, drive him out the window. That is frightening. One star trip advisor, says Angela Sanchez. Yeah, I would say so. It feels like a one star review to me. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hmm. Uh, so that's one. So, so the ghost. There you go. Um, Swooping is bad, says it was a thousand times scarier than the first one, but the first one was by far the better story, in my opinion. Uh... Yeah, I think that's I think that's accurate. I much preferred the first story on an intellectual level. Also, it was more fun to read. Um, but that second story, ugh, give me the creeps. It's the it's the it's the insomnia stuff with the dreams and the following. Out. There's just a there's a lot of creepy, sinister stuff in there. Next, I want to talk about the Colonel, who turns out to be quite the hero. Um, I saw in the chat. Folks hypothesizing about some romantic overtones at the point where the treasure at uh, the point treasure at the point where the colonel offers to um uh offers to um you know it's just like if you need me in the night you know where I am and I dig it I ship it yep works for me <laughs> colonel MVP says Angela Sanchez yeah 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 the colonel was rad says secret agent Sam yeah cool and just the way like burst in fearlessly and then slept in the haunted bed colonel save some badassery for the rest of us colonel's like my friend's being haunted i will immediately help and sleep in the haunted bed amadeus121 says the colonel is exactly what i wanted him to be yeah the colonel colonel for the win says theo wallace oh yeah Oh, we have some generous super chats. Amadeus one to one says, "Brilliant as always. Thank you, Amadeus. Thank you for watching." Kaiser a dark light. Luke, might I say you deliver these stories with a sense of dread and terror that only you can. Thank you. I do my best. Hopefully, it's creepy. I think it's mostly just the fire crackling sound in the background that's really uh that makes the mood rather than me. And Jano one one seven says, "I want to join Lucas Petrie. Looking forward to a lovely lullaby tomorrow." Glad I caught the end. Have a treat for your great work. Thank you, Jano117. That is very generous. And Lucas Petrie says, haven't been able to catch this live, so I'll watch the VOD. But I saw you were still streaming, so I thought I'd chip in towards the recovery drinks you'll need after this story time. And thank you for continuing to do these streams. They're amazing. Thank you. Thank you, Lucas. That will absolutely buy me uh, buy me around, and it's very much appreciated. Um, Gentleman Drill says, your deliverance of the stories is uh, always so amazing, the way you read it, and the voice is so good. I read that comment quickly because it's praise and we have to read praise quickly or else it goes in and we feel it. Hmm. Well, yeah, that was great. <laughs> I want to highlight this uh, comment. Odd luck imagining a review of the hotel. The housekeeping staff were pleasant enough, but the sheets practically stood on their own. Would not stay again. That is good. That is good. It's a one star trip advisor situation. Yep. So... The Colonel. Colonel Wilson. We have our heroes. We've got we got two great characters out of the stories tonight. We've got Colonel Wilson storming around also. Can we we didn't really take a break, but can we talk about how Colonel Wilson can we talk about Colonel Wilson's advice to the little boy to um next what does he say? Um I wanna find it. He's like, next time, like a good English boy, just throw a rock <laughs> at, at your problems. <laughs> Next time, boy, just throw a rock at your problems. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, there's one other thing that I want to talk about because there's some, there's some ambiguity in the end of this story. Obviously, um, at the end, Parkins and Rogers and the Colonel get together, our best boys, all in a gang, and they have a sort of chit-chat about what went down. And then the Colonel throws the whistle into the sea, which to me feels a bit reckless because if that doesn't stop the haunting, you cannot get it back. I would have put it back where it was in the preceptory and the hole that it came out of. Personally, that would have been my move. But... The colonel yeeted it into the ocean. But then it says that there was a um, trail of smoke rising from the from the back, which suggests that something um, um, was burned. Yeah. Um, later on, the smoke of a burning ascended from the back premises of the globe. I would guess that's perhaps the bedsheets. Are they burning the bedsheets that were possessed by the ghost? Um... That's the only thing I can think, but I thought that was a little ambiguous, the smoke of a burning. So let me know in the chat what do you think that was. David Badalotti says, thanks as always, Luke. Thank you, David Badalotti. That's very kind. Yeah, I suspect the bedclothes, says John Burnham. Arsere says, did they burn the bed sheets? Yep, 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 yep. <laughs> and Mr. Team Corvette, Dan says, did they burn the bed or the whole room just to be safe? Yeah, I'd have burned burn the, burn the whole thing. Paul Harry says, Luke, did M.R. James really, really hate Latin? I think M.R. James really, really loved Latin. Loved it enough to put it into every single story. <laughs> Burned it from orbit, says Marie Hull. Yep, yep, yep. Yep, odd luck. Same vibes. Burn the hotel. It's the only way to be sure. Okay, all right. So we're, we were, we're agreed that the sheets are what we're burning there. Cool. All right, all right, all right. Fair enough. Um... Again, bold. Like, I don't think you can especially dispel ghosts generally by burning some stuff and throwing the haunted things into the sea. But there you go. It, that's the colonel's whole personality. If he's got a problem, throw it in the sea. <laughs> throw a rock at it. <laughs> Sapphire Butterfly says, throw a rock at it, eat it into the sea. That tracks. Mm. Cool. Well, I thought those stories were great. Thank you so much for watching with me. Um, I really enjoyed this one. This was great. And a lot of people watching as well, which I am so pleased to see. Uh, if you enjoyed this, and I think we've got a lovely uh, community going in the chat. Uh, tell a friend. Drag a friend into the fold. Get them involved. Get them haunted. Why should you, why should you be haunted only? Get your friends haunted as well. That's my advice. Maybe, maybe tell them that this stream is um, not haunting. Maybe tell them it's... Um, Maybe tell them it's something else. Maybe tell them it's um, rational stories of rational stories of unremarkable happenings. Um, and then when they watch it, bam, haunted. Karima says, hashtag get haunted. Kelsey Schoenbaum, this story proves you always need a friend to be haunted with. Yeah, you know what? What is nice about this story, actually, I think, and it's not been the case in all of the MR James stories that we've read, is that I feel like there's a genuine friendship actually in both the stories there's a genuine friendship at the core of it there's the sort of there's the sisterhood there's the sisters in the first one and then um yeah and then parkers and the colonel they're cool they're cool um well folks i think that's going to do it for us thank you so much for uh, all of your um wonderful comments thanks for keeping me company uh hopefully you enjoyed this we'll do another one um next week um i think i will move this to being a midweek thing uh, it works a little easier for me, uh, for my schedule, and if, you know, I, I think it's sort of, I don't know, uh, we, we've got about the same number of views, viewers as we had on Sunday, so I kind of have to assume that people are fine with it, fingers crossed. Um, yeah, so thanks very much for watching. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Shall I do a ghostly, a ghostly fade into nothingness just before we end? All right. Thanks very much for watching, folks. This was a real joy, and we'll see you next time, and until then, remain unhaunted. Bye, 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 bye.